I want to talk this morning about localization methods, which I'll say uh, what these are. So I think some people in the room are very familiar with them. Some people maybe have seen a little less of them, so I'll sort of have an intro to that. Um, my name is Neil. I'm in the computer science department, but I'm sort of an applied mathematician by, by background. So that's sort of, uh, I sit at that intersection. And uh, I am right now at IPAM in April 2022, but normally I'm at, at Cornell. Okay, so just right off the bat, I do want to, to make the acknowledgments. So uh, the things I'm going to be talking about today are joint work with a number of people. Um, so some of the more recent things I'm going to talk about, which pertain to objective functions and the, the virtual orbitals part I'm not going to talk about today because uh, we're, still, we're still working on that, is joint work with Kang Bo Lee, one of my students who's right here in the front of the audience. So he's responsible for large amounts of the first part of this talk, and he's here for the long program. So also... Um, if uh, you have questions after my talk, I'm happy to chat, and, and Kang buzz around for, for an extended period of time to, to talk to, and I think is uh, very excited to, to talk to other folks here and learn things. Um, Rob DeSasio, one of the organizers of this session, uh, Cornell had been working together along with one of his postdocs, uh, Shin Yuko. And then some of the other stuff I'll talk about um, in sort of the, the tail end of my talk is some, some earlier work on something we call SCDM, and that's uh, joint work with Lynn. Uh, Leshing at, at Stanford, my advisor, Antoine Levette at uh, INRIA, and Eric uh, Philomer, who was a postdoc with Rob and is now at the Mayo, Mayo Clinic. Um, so all of these folks have been involved in uh, various ways with, with parts of this. Okay, so I want to dive in and, and just talk a little bit about the setup for uh, what I call the, the localization problem to kind of get everybody on the same page. And some of this is going to be a bit light on details in that there's several different settings you can set some of these problems up in, and I'm going to try to uh, have a bit of a unified picture. So just have the essential pieces of, of what I need. So for the sake of this talk, uh, and unless it changes later, then I'll say something. I'm just going to think about having some set of eigenfunctions of a solvent joint Hamiltonian, and I'm going to have all the ones with eigenvalues in some interval i. So for the moment, you can just think of this as like the lowest line eigenvalues this operator. And I'm going to denote these as psi j for j equals 1 to capital N. Okay? Later on, I'll talk a little bit about what happens when how you define i becomes a little complicated, shall we say. But for the moment, let's just imagine that I solve some, say, self-consistent problem. I get some eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, and I have n of them. Okay? And we're going to talk about what we can do with these n eigenfunctions. All right? And specifically, we're going to talk about what's known as the localization problem, or a localization problem, or the computation of linear functions, or any number of other things. So the idea, and I'll say a little bit more about why, is that I have these n eigenfunctions, and I might want a different basis than the eigenfunctions themselves for some reason. Okay? And in particular, what we're going to be interested in doing today is looking for a basis of so-called linear functions, which I'll call phi, that have various properties. And I'll show some, some pictures on the next slide to maybe make this more concrete. But I'm going to want each of the basis functions to sort of only be significant on some small part of the domain. So most of its mass is in some small region of the computational domain. Uh, related to that, I would like each of the phi to decay rapidly away from their center. So you can think of these as like Gaussian-looking functions. We'll see in a moment. And I'm going to sometimes want fewer of them than I have eigenfunctions. That's going to be particularly the case where you say don't have a gap in a system um, or you're looking at some number of entangled bands and, and things get a little more complicated. So for the first part of this talk, nw will always be n. Okay? And I want these functions to, well, if nw equals n, I want the span of the local functions I get to be the same as the span of the eigenfunctions. If nw is less than n, then I want the span of the local functions to be contained in the span of the eigenfunctions. So I have to identify a nice subspace and some local functions. I guess this got cut off at the bottom, but I'll just say, you know, it, it's not immediately obvious, I guess, why this is possible or when this is possible. I'll say a bit more on that later on. But for the moment, just believe me that, you know, this is a problem we can sometimes solve. Okay? But I think pictures make it a little clear, um, especially if folks haven't seen this before, which is on the left, so here I have a simple 1D example um, with a sort of periodic looking potential. I can compute eigenfunctions related to a self joint Hamiltonian, and they look sort of messy in some sense, right? They're functions that are just supported everywhere on this 1D computational domain, right? There's not a lot of structure to them. But there's an equivalent basis for those functions, and some more that are sort of off screen to the right, that looks like this, right? So every basis function is this very nicely, highly localized, Gaussian looking. Right? And in many cases, working with these functions 
is going to be much nicer than those, and I'll, I'll say a few things on why. In the sort of uh, not 1D toy picture, you can imagine that you get some kind of eigenfunction or molecular orbital psi that is sort of supported on the entirety of the molecule, and you would like to find basis functions that are supported on some small amount of this. And when I say supported, I really mean they're sufficiently small outside this, right? So they may never go to zero. They're not sort of sparse in a formal sense, but they get small enough that you can truncate them and uh, control errors, okay? All right, so this is the, the sort of problem setup. Um, as was noted, I'm in a computer science department. I'm sort of a numerical linear algebra person by, by background, so I think of this as a linear algebra problem much of the time. Um, and I mean, obviously, it's important where the linear algebra problems come from, so we will talk about that. But one way I like to view this is that upon discretization of these psi, I can view this as a basis transform problem. So when nw is n, I have some matrix psi, so I can think of each column as one of my eigenfunctions. And what I want to do is find a unitary matrix Q, or in the case where nw is less than n, a subunitary matrix. So it still has orthonormal columns, but not rows, such that I can write my local functions phi as psi times Q. Okay, so really I'm looking for this unitary matrix or subunitary matrix that transforms the basis I have to the basis I want. Okay? And so we're going to talk uh, today about finding Q in a couple different ways. All right? Okay, so I, I do want to have a slide on sort of uh, why we want these, right? Because it's, it's an alternative basis. And we've actually seen uh, several examples even earlier in this workshop. So when your functions have come up, I think, on... Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and also earlier today, Eric mentioned they came up briefly in, in the talk. So they've showed up in several of the talks. But the idea is that these localization methods play a key role in downstream computational methods. So you can imagine that if I go from some set of sort of unstructured eigenfunctions in a way to local eigenfunctions, it in a very general sense can be used to sort of induce sparsity, right? If I have two local functions, that sort of live in very different regions of the computational domain, then they, they don't interact in a certain sense, right? Now, what that means specifically depends on how I'm using them, right? But certainly one can imagine that, you know, if the support of this function is completely disjoint from this, then anytime I end up with, say, some integral between them, it's just zero, and I know this a priori. I don't have to really do anything. So this shows a lot, up a lot in, in so-called linear scaling methods. It's useful for accelerating exact exchange calculations and, and much more. I think the way we've seen it the most in, in uh, this workshop is for band interpolation. So I'll have uh, some things on that later. But, um, you know, that's just one of, of many. And there's a nice review paper by uh, Marzari et al. in 2012 that talks about a whole host of, of applications. So if you're interested in more, there's, there's a lot there. Okay? But... The focus of today's talk is going to be on how we sort of solve this problem computationally, right? So if you hand me a set of eigenfunctions, what can I do to find the associated set of localized functions, all right? Because it's one thing, you know, even if we know they exist, that doesn't necessarily mean they're easy to find, right? It's one thing to say, yes, I can find these. It's another to actually compute them, okay? And so I want to start with a, a prototype scheme. And I say this is one option because... Uh, it doesn't encompass all localization schemes, but it sort of encompasses the framework I'm going to talk about today. So I'll say a little more on that in a second. So one way I can think about solving this problem is to mathematically define some measure of locality. So you give me a function, I tell you how local it is, smaller numbers are better. And then I could set up an optimization problem that I try to solve, which says, okay, let me look at some function of the locality of every phi and just try to minimize this. Right? So I, I sort of optimize over orthogonal matrices or subunitary matrices some function of the locality of each phi. Right? And, and sort of this is a, a very reasonable thing to do in that I've defined locality mathematically, or I will in a little bit, and then just try to you know, make everything as local as possible. However, this kind of setup, as we'll see later, is often not the nicest optimization problem in the world. It has various... Uh, sort of things you have to deal with. So certainly uh, the constraints alone make it non-convex. So this is a manifold optimization problem since I have to work over unitary matrices. That introduces some complexity, right? So that's not so easy to work with. And then uh, depending on how I pick the function f and the locality measure, I could have other issues, okay? Uh, if you want a concrete example of this, I realize this may look a little general. You could imagine that the simplest thing I could do is just look at the sum of the spreads, right? So I have n... W 
like I said, put the summation indices, nw of these local functions, I just sum up the, the spreads and minimize that. But people do look at other things. Um, I'll note in my also cut off footnote here. Um, so there's certainly like there's some folks in the audience here. Uh, for example, Francois has set this up as a simultaneous diagonalization problem so that it's related to certain formulations in the optimization world, but algorithmically just looks a little different when you, when you write it down. Also, uh, Kevin Stubbs, who's, I saw you there, back there, okay. Also has some methods that look a little, little different than this. So this is the world I'm gonna be talking about today, but it's not sort of the only way you can think about, can think about this problem, okay? But it, it's a good prototype scheme for the, the purpose of today's talk. Okay, so I just wanna make a few observations on this, which is that there's a number of choices in this prototype scheme. So first, I get to choose F and my measure of locality. And it turns out how I pick these can impact how effectively we can solve the problem, right? So you could imagine I could make good or bad choices for various reasons, okay? Talk about that. But it's not like for all functions F and locality measures L, this is an equally easy or hard problem to solve, okay? The other thing that'll come up is that we may often need a good initialization. So this might be some complicated non-convex optimization problem where I start might matter. Right? I can't sort of just invoke a theorem that says, yes, I always get to the global optimum or something. Right? So where we start could influence which local functions we get out. Okay? Um, it's also the case that the choice of F and L could influence which orbitals you get. Right? If I define a mathematical measure of locality and I change it a little bit. Ah, question. From... Yes. Yes. Uh, question. Are you uh, imposing orthogonality of the localized functions? Uh, yes. I, uh, I forgot that on the, the earlier slide. So yes, here I am with the uh, constraint on Q. I forgot to mention that on my localization problem slide. But yeah, for, for this, they'll always be orthogonal. Yep. Thank you. Oh, all right. The, the video's there. Okay. Cool. Um, and then, like I said, we sort of need to appeal to manifold optimization techniques because of uh, the constraint on, on Q. So today I'm going to talk about the first two things here. I'm going to talk about uh, measures of locality and how they impact how effectively we can solve the problem. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about good initialization methods uh, for this. So how you try to start close to a good optimum uh, and hopefully not have to optimize for too long. I'm not going to talk so much about the second two parts here. Okay? But certainly this latter one, manifold optimization, is a very large field in and of itself. So there's a lot of good methods uh, that one can appeal to to get there. Okay, so uh, for the first part of this talk, I'm gonna talk about a measure of locality that we call the density convolution, which is going to be sort of a uh, new but related way to measure locality of orbitals in, in periodic settings, yes? So how important is actually the orthogonality? Because you're mentioning when you have localization, you kind of have this orthogonality. So what if you like relax this, uh, so, right. So, so there's a couple. So one thing is, as long as you work with an orthogonal basis, things are often simpler in, in a variety of ways, depending on the problem. Right. So as soon as you go to a non-orthogonal basis, it tends to introduce additional things you have to take into consideration. It's not that you can't work in a non-orthogonal basis, but uh, maybe one way I think of it is, if you're orthogonal, things simplify. As soon as you're not orthogonal at all it introduces a bunch of complexity. So even if you have a very well-conditioned basis, as soon as it's not orthogonal, there's some things you have to take into account, right? And maybe it's fine, but it, it does up the complexity, so. But yes, you, you could definitely think of saying, I care more about locality than orthogonality and making that trade-off. Yeah. Cool, okay. So uh, to motivate you in this part of the talk, I want to sort of build up some of the classical measures people use for locality and then talk about sort of the, the new things we're building. So first I want to talk about this if you're in an infinite domain. So you can think of R as, well, literally as, as R. So the, the picture here is in 1D. And in an infinite system, it's quite natural to define locality as, essentially what I say is variance. So there's, you know, statistics in the title of uh, the long program. So maybe here's a little bit of statistics and that I can equate this to variance. But the idea is uh, the variance of a function is a reasonable measure of its locality, right? And we think of for, for a Gaussian or something, you know, the, the larger the variance, the more spread out it is. And in the, the sort of quantum chemistry context, that corresponds to the so-called Foster-Boys criteria for locality. So they say, okay, uh, 
if I have some function psi and I want to measure locality, I look at the second moment and the squared first moment and, and take the difference. So I compute the variance of each orbit. Okay? And in an infinite domain, this is perfectly sensible. But uh, one thing that has certainly come up in this, this workshop and more, we often are not working in infinite domains, but in periodic systems or in condensed phase systems. And as soon as you do that, things get a little more complicated. Okay? So there's a question of, okay, let's say I'm in a periodic domain. Now how do I define locality? And there's a couple of questions that come up right away. So first is, if I have an orbital and periodic replicates of it, what the actual center of an orbital is, you know, it, in some sense, it may, you could think of it as having many, many centers and you have to pick one. Or that you have infinite copies of the orbital with, you know, shifted centers, right? But it, it's not as clearly unambiguous as in the, the uh, sort of infinite plane case. In fact, to the point where uh, people had to redefine position operators for periodic domains. So that's the 98 paper, yes. Uh, from someone coming from a molecular side, yes. you mean when you want to localize orbitals here, are you localizing them within a group of K um, um, of periodic functions? So are you localizing, localizing it absolutely, or you're going to have a localized periodic function? So, we're, sorry, I missed the last part then. Are, are, you, are you aiming to, to make a localized periodic function or a localized, a function localized in? Ah, the latter. So a function localized is the right thing, and then we'll have periodic replicates of it. So it'll be localized many, many times. Right? What's your question answer? I saw the question was different. Well, I mean, because I'm confused, once you have a localized function, that variance should still apply. Um, yeah, so, so I'll say, I'll bring in like k-point sampling and things in a second, and maybe that'll make this. <coughs> Well, just maybe so. Yeah, you explain. Maybe in, in molecules, you sometimes choose a band, yep. and make localization just in the way. So you could. So ah. if you say it k, you could mix. A different yes. Yes. Band. Ah. Okay. Or you can. Uh, uh, right. So I'll have k points up in a second, but yeah. So for the moment, you can think of it some isolated set of bands that you're you're looking at. Yep. Um, so. Yeah. Cool. And then um, the other thing is if I'm in a periodic domain like minus LL and I have a function like this, how I define a second moment is actually not as clean as in the infinite dimensional case. Oops. And so just to highlight this, I want to look at a little 1D toy example that is admittedly a bit contrived but may convince you that uh, definitions get a little complicated. So let's say I have a periodic domain minus L to L and I put a kind of quirky function in there, which I'll, I'll call uh, V, which is two Dirac masses at minus A and A, okay? So part of it's here, part of it's here, and it has amplitude one. And I could ask the question, what should the center of this function be, and what should its spread be, okay? So it's a little contrived because it's like two point masses, right? The center doesn't seem maybe super well, well defined, but, you know, it's maybe a, a question to ask you want your definition to be able to cover, right? If you define the center of a function, it should give some number for this, okay? So you can ask, what's the center of this, this density, and what about its spread? And it turns out something interesting happens, which is, if you look at this function in an infinite domain, then it's perfectly reasonable. You can look at the center of it, and it varies continuously as you sort of change the amplitude of these two Dirac's from one Dirac to the other, right? So, if all of the mass is at minus A, then it says that's the center. If all the mass is at A, that's the center. And it goes continuously between the two. So that's this sort of yellow orange line. Most periodic definitions of centers are actually discontinuous in this, in that they'll basically say if there's more mass on the left Dirac, the center is minus A. If there's more mass on the right one, the center is A. Okay? And it's, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to claim one is always more or less sensible than the other, but there's a very clear discrepancy here, right? In that if I think of those two Dirac's in a periodic domain and measure the center, I get something that's discontinuous. If I think of them in sort of all space and measure it, I get something nice and continuous. So that's at least a very different flavor, very different behavior in the periodic and non-periodic case, all right? Similarly, if you take that 
and measure spread as if those two Dirac's were in the infinite domain, you get this, this yellow function. So uh, at pi over four, you can compute the spread as A shifts the peaks further and further apart, and you get one curve. And as the peaks shift further and further apart, the spread you get when you think of it periodically is sort of an underestimate of the real space spread. Okay, so you might imagine I take to these two peaks, I move them apart, the spread should be increasing in some sense, right, if it's one function. Uh, and it does if you measure it this way, and some periodic measure of that would actually underestimate things. Okay? All right, so now I'm going to introduce just a little bit of notation to talk about how people have defined centers and spreads traditionally for doing localization and then talk about what we have that's a little bit different. Okay, so this is a little bit of a necessary notation, I guess, to, to set this up. But what I'm going to imagine now is that we have some periodic atomic structure with a periodic potential. So I'm going to, to do all the notation in 1D, but it all generalizes nicely to 2 or, or 3D, but um, the pictures and, and notation gets a little bit more complicated, okay? So we have some periodic potential V of R, so I have V of R plus A1N is V of R, okay? And then I can define the lattice that is uh, this vector A1 here times N1, and I can have a unit cell for each point there that is, say, A1 times minus a half to a half, okay? So this is the piece right around that, that center. And when I set the problem of this way with so-called k-point sampling, you can actually define the eigenfunctions of, as these block orbitals that have an exponential part, e to the i r k, and a periodic part, u, okay? And the only reason I'm, I'm really gonna need this later is we're gonna work with these functions u most of the time, okay? So we're just gonna work with the periodic part of these, these block orbitals, all right? Okay, and when you're in this setting, you can think, and maybe this answers the, the question from earlier a little bit too, that what we're really gonna do is try to compute a bunch of local orbitals for each cell, and they should be translates of each other, okay? So if I have a, a local function at say capital R equals zero, I can translate it to R equals three with a phase shift in, in a Fourier transform, okay? So, I can just sort of move around this lattice and get replicates of my, my local functions, okay? Um, the, the key point I wanna make here is that because we define these functions spatially via something that looks like a, a Fourier transform over these points K, then smoothness in that index K corresponds to locality, right? So if I have Fourier transforms if I have a very local function, its Fourier transform is very smooth, and vice versa. If I have a very smooth function, its Fourier transform is local, okay? In ways that can be made more precise than, than I will here. But the idea is that if I work with those uh, block orbitals and they're smooth in K, then the associated Wenier functions they define will be rapidly decaying in R, okay? All right. So that gives me the notation to talk about, I think, the most uh, common approach to computing these Wenier functions in this setting, which was developed by Marzari and Vanderbilt in 1997 and has a, had a number of things sort of uh, going on since then. So this is not by any means a comprehensive uh, picture of what's going on. But the idea is that uh, in 97, Marzari and Vanderbilt said, okay, let's optimize a location criteria omega that is inspired by Foster Boys, this notion of locality in in real space. And what they realized is, well, from some early work by Blout, you can actually reformulate that criteria in K space via gradient operators and Laplacian operators, right? And so I'll bring this up later on. The way I like to think about this is if I have the operator R in, in one space, then under the Fourier transform that becomes a gradient or vice versa, right? We sometimes think of if I'm taking a gradient, then in Fourier space it's multiplying by K, or whatever the index is. I can also write down the Laplacian operator in Fourier space, okay? However, actually computing this, if I have some finite set of K, is not so clear, right? I have a gradient in K or a Laplacian in K, and so what Marzari and Vanderbilt propose doing is using something that's sort of akin to finite differences in K. So they say, okay, I can rewrite localization in terms of gradients of these periodic part of the block orbitals u and k. Let me just evaluate those with finite differences, 
And that gives me some way to compute uh, a measure of locality, okay? And it turns out to be pretty nice because you can actually then compute everything just by looking at overlaps between these periodic part of the block orbitals, these, yes. Uh, in, oh yes, thank you, here, yes. So one of these should be k plus b, thank you, yes. So I'm looking at overlaps between uh, things at k and nearby neighbors. Um, and sort of roughly simultaneous to, to this, where they said, okay, we're gonna do these finite differences, RESTA defined a position operator for periodic boundary conditions that uh, is sort of closely related to this. It showed up in some earlier work, um, maybe less formally or, or less sort of as defining a position operator, but when people were trying to study systems in periodic boundary conditions and actually defining position operators was not so clear, okay? And it's actually a consistent definition in that if I take the size of the cell to infinity, it sort of recovers uh, what you would expect for the infinite domain, okay? Um, however, I guess one of the things I wanna highlight is that this scheme does have several sort of shortcomings or, or limitations, which is what we're gonna try to address. So one thing is if you go through all the, the machinery and there's uh, details in, well, certainly in the, the older papers, we're working on writing something that'll have these, but if you go through all the machinery and say, okay, using the sort of finite difference-esque formula in the Marzari and Vanderbilt paper, how do you actually compute a center of an orbital? You get this interesting function that says, okay, I'm going to sum over what they call shells, which is the sort of finite difference grid, and then I have to take the imaginary log of these overlaps, okay? And you can imagine, as soon as I have an imaginary log, I have choices to make because this function has a branch cut. Right, so, you know, which branch I take, which surface I end up on, can change things. And for example, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, by the log of that, you mean the log of the determinant? Of yes, I missed the, the notation I meant to have in there. Yes, thank you. Yep, the log of the determinant. I think I'll make, there was a cut and paste, so that might uh, show up on future slides, thank you. Yes. So. For example, you could imagine as I change B here, if I pick like inconsistent versions of this branch cut, this definition might not be so great, right? If I don't consistently pick branches of the logarithm, right? But more generally, uh, the use of this function can actually result in a lot of false local minima. We'll see that in, in some experiments later on. It's also not necessarily clear that these definitions even converge nicely as say L goes to infinity or the, the norm of B goes to zero. Okay, so that's why I put the, the convergence in a, a question mark. The position operator that REST defined converges as L goes to infinity. These finite difference things, there's actually no bounds or sort of control on how quickly they would converge in that, okay? If we think of it as a finite difference, we might expect it to, but there's actually uh, not in their work on that. Um, and it also doesn't have error bounds to any kind of like ground truth definition of, of locality. And it requires a special reduction to the gamma point only case. So I'm not gonna talk about that, but if you don't have K points and wanna reduce this, so to a gamma point only calculation, it takes a little more work. And, and uh, folks did that later on. And optimization of this may converge very slowly as we'll see in uh, various numerical experiments. Okay, so what I wanna talk about today is a, a new formulation that we've developed for defining the, the center and spread, which we call the, the density convolution, okay? And I'll sort of write it and explain it in, in 1D, and then some more notation will come in later on. So let's say I have a, a density rho. Then one way you can define the center of, say, a probability density is it's the point around which the second moment is minimized. So I guess we don't always talk about it that way or present it that way, but that's an equivalent definition of the center of something, is I can say, find the point around which the second moment of a function is minimized, that is the center, okay? And so the reason we get uh, convolution as a name is we can think of, okay, maybe I should define the center as saying convolve r minus c, or convolve r squared with the density, and find the minimum over c, right? So I'm literally finding the point around which the second moment is minimized. And that is, as I said, equal to computing this first moment or, or the standard expectation, okay? And so this right here is in an infinite domain and we can imagine that if I wanted to find things in a situation with periodic boundary conditions, I simply truncate my domains of integration, okay? 
So I simply say, oops, sorry, spread definition. Okay, so the center is the minimizer of this over C. I can define it without the argmin as the spread, right? So that's the, the variance piece that I want to minimize the second moment. So I can say, all right, let's define that simply as the convolution of R squared with R, but only over some portion of the domain, SC. So some minus L to L interval centered around C and do this convolution. And then you can shuffle things around to just make this around zero, right? So you can change domains of, of integration and say what I'm gonna do is convolve shifted versions of my density with R squared over minus L to L. And that's one way to define spread. And then if I take the minimum over C, I get the center of a function, okay? And so this is also a, a truncation in some sense in that this is a sensible definition in an infinite domain, and then we're just truncating it, right? We're literally chopping how, how far the, the domain of the, the convolution is, okay? But one way I like to think about this is that uh, it has the equivalent sort of idea in, in the Fourier domain, which is, well, as I mentioned earlier, in an infinite domain, I can think of going between position operators and gradients and R squared and Laplacians. And what I simply do is truncate R and R squared to minus L to L. And sort of my, uh, what I put on my like differential equation or PDE hat, I think of this as the density convolution is a spectrally accurate representation of the gradient or the Laplacian. So you can actually think of it as like, instead of a finite difference type method, we're using a spectral method to compute the gradient and the Laplacian and using that to define center and spread instead of say a first order finite difference or something else, okay? So whether or not that's uh, helpful as intuition, I, I think it's, uh, I like to think of it that way, which is it's sort of equivalent to a spectral definition of the gradient and Laplacian operators, okay? All right, so I wanna say just a bit about properties uh, this definition has before I, I dive into then how we use it to actually do optimization and computation of local functions. So the first thing is it's uh, consistent in the limit as L goes to infinity. So it's a, a perfectly sensible definition as the size of your cell gets large. It has sort of the, the proper translation symmetry. So if I translate a density, the center moves with that translation just as I would expect. So there's no sort of weird, weird behavior there. The spread is always continuous, even if the center is not. Okay, so I showed in that earlier picture, the center of a, a function in this periodic domain may not be continuous, but the spread is, okay? While I think it's a nice formulation, it's a little hard to optimize directly, and one reason is that it's, it's non-local, so it's the spectral kind of definition, not like a first order finite difference type definition, but we're working on that, so we're, that's still, still work in progress. What we've been doing so far is using it and systematically truncating the formula to get more and more local definitions of spread. So we'll get something a little different than Marzari Vanderbilt by truncating this convolution definition, but it turns out to have very nice properties for optimization, okay? Moreover, uh, we get rigorous bounds in that we can actually say that the density convolution representation of spread is less than or equal to the foster boys criteria and when we truncate it, as I will in a second, that's also a lower bound. So we actually have, in the way we compute spread, lower bounds on the sort of measure you would get if you thought of it over minus infinity to infinity. Whereas like the Marzari Vanderbilt stuff doesn't actually have bounds. It could overestimate, underestimate. It's less clear, okay? Here we know we're always underestimating the spread if you thought of the function in the infinite domain. Yes? Yes, um, so the, uh... Uh, sharp truncation at the edges seems a little bit unnatural and maybe mm -hmm. leading to uh, local minima rather than some sort of weighting function and a tapering off. Right. So uh, I would say sort of yes and no maybe. I guess in that, um, I mean, so the way I think of it is like a first order finite difference. I'll, I'll have this in a few slides actually. So I'll come back to it. It does correspond to say, okay, I'm gonna approximate say R by a sine function, which is then nice and periodic. But um, you're then not approximating R very well away from the origin, right? So there is a trade-off in that. Um, and I, I guess I can't say, it's not that there's no effects of doing a sharp truncation at minus L and L, but certainly the empirical evidence so far is that it works much better. And that's maybe the most I can say. If that, 
answers, or somewhat answers the question. I guess it's an incomplete answer. Okay. Okay. So um, for the sake of time, actually, I'm going to go through this uh, fairly quickly. But the idea is that we can take that convolution definition and systematically truncate it by making various approximations. So I'm going to maybe uh, cut this off and, and actually say the following, which is you can systematically truncate that definition, OK? Roughly by making the approximations r equals sine r and 1 minus r squared is cosine r, OK? So this actually conceptually looks similar to if you analyze um, the Barzari Vanderbilt thing, but you get subtly different formula. So I'm not going to put uh, the details here, but you get things that look just a little bit different. But the key point is that you can start with that convolution definition and systematically truncate it by making approximations for r and r squared. Okay? And you could make them better and better in our formulation. So you could say, I don't just want to go to first order, I want to go to second, third, fourth, as far as you want, and you would get some formula you could use. Okay? Um, I don't know that there's much of a reason to go beyond sort of this first order style approximation, given how well it works, as we'll see, but you could in principle. Like it gives you a systematic way to define better and better approximations uh, to this convolutional definition. Okay? Hi, Von Neumann asked this, you yes. some sort of a Yeah, so what I mean by this is uh, often right when, like, if I have a first order, find a different scheme and analyze it, that's where I find that that in the Fourier domain leads to a sine approximation of R, right? Uh -huh. So maybe that's, okay. this is not quite the... Right, right, yeah, okay. well, only in terms of the technique. <laughs> only in terms of the technique. Right. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry. So, so can you go back to the thing that you... Uh, Skipped. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so this is something that has always been uh, bothering me a bit, yeah. which is if you look at the orthorhombic cell, it's more or less, I still need to work a bit through show that this recovers simple differences. Yes. Right? Right. Uh, and uh, for now, the rhombic cell seems like there are many ways you can do this. I mean, yes. some, uh, I some like Right. So this certainly, uh, it gets much more complicated. Um, and there are, right, so that's where sort of the development, even in the early work, sort of had orthorhombic things, and then it took time to make it work for non-orthorhombic things, right? Because you have to derive what exactly, how do I define these shells and which set of them do I use? We use the same ones used in the Marzari Vanderbilt line of work. So we don't have anything new in this regard. That does mean that I don't know that I can provide much additional intuition or information on that. Um, but, okay. It's not essential that you pick the right D vectors. You can pick yeah. any three and it will work for optimization purposes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, if there's better or worse choices is, is less clear, right? Like, if you want to recover certain finite different schemes, then you have to make specific choices. But in principle, you can use any sort of consistent definition, right? As long as there's no collinearity in these, then you get a scheme out. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, maybe just more yeah. about the question that uh, this kind of weird finite different schemes whether these are used in some other context, because this is something I only see in this particular. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Did this say, like you're also recognizing some other brother? It's a good question. I never, never understood. This. I mean that. Yeah. I can verify Taylor and <laughs> verify that. Yeah, there's some first order accuracy, but that's about it. It's used in other contexts. Yeah, I don't know that I've actually seen it. I mean, that's why the, the connections to the sort of uh, finite difference type analysis are a little yeah. hand wavy, right? They're not, uh, it's not quite exactly the same. Yeah, sorry, Francois, did you have? Yeah, no, I was going to ask about the connection with uh, Stengel and Spalding. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> it's, uh, this is my slightly <laughs> cut off, I think. The <laughs> yeah, so, so it actually, um, maybe I'll comment on this. So, when we truncate this density convolution, we actually recover a formula that people had found in 06, in the Steingel and Spalding paper. What was interesting is that reading that paper, people basically saw it as, oh, it's essentially equivalent to the, the Marzari Vanderbilt formulation. And then, at least to, to the best of, of my knowledge, it wasn't very much used for optimization instead of that formula. Um, so it's not that people said they were the same, but that they felt it would maybe work somewhat equivalently 
for localization. Um, that might be, and I'd be curious to hear more about, uh, about that. But when you do this truncation, you do get formulae that have appeared in the literature before, at least the first order truncation. The higher order ones, I don't think um, you would find. Yep. Cool. Okay, so I, I'm going to sort of loop past the formula to make sure I have time to, to wrap up with some other things, but what I want to highlight is that uh, just this simple change of formula, so going from the Marzari-Vanderbilt formula that's used in Winear 90, one of the very popular software packages, to this truncation of the density convolution yields very different behavior when you go to actually optimize these functions. So this is an example for, for silicon where we look at the following things. Uh, we optimize the first order truncation of the density convolution. We use Winear 90. Okay, so this is we're actually using their code and just everything that they have, right? So we're not, uh, not playing it, anything there. And then we evaluate the density convolution definition. And we also evaluate the spread functional used in one year 90 along our optimization trajectory. So we say, okay, we're gonna follow and optimize our objective function, but we're gonna also evaluate the spread by this other definition, okay? And we see here a couple interesting things. So the first maybe high order bit is that uh, to get to convergence, when your 90 takes over here like 350 or 400 iterations, and optimizing this first order truncation converges beautifully in like 30 iterations or 40 iterations, okay? So it converges much more like you would expect uh, optimization of some relatively smooth function to behave. So it says, I've gone incredibly nicely to a local, it might still be a local minima, the function's still non-convex, all these things, but it converges sort of beautifully. Uh, it does not, okay, it takes much longer. The other thing, it's a little hard to see later on, but we along the way evaluate the density convolution definition of the spread and see that ours is an underestimate of this versus the, for example, uh, one year 90 definition used is actually an overestimate later on and an underestimate early on. So it can be on either side of that definition, okay? And so this is one example, right, where we took and, and tried to optimize things. But we were also curious, like, how consistent is this, this behavior? So we did something that's maybe a little odd, but sort of the, the best we can do for the moment, which is say, let's take some materials and try to find local functions from random initial gauges. Right, so often, and I'll in the last five minutes talk about initialization, often we try to find a good initial guess and optimize from there. But let's see how well we can do if we skip that part and just take random gauges as initialization. So take random orthogonal matrices and see how we do, okay? Maybe we won't do well, but we'll try to do something, yes? So one question before you go on. So does this mean that the, the one you found with your method ends up being less localized with respect to the Mazari Vanderbilt spread? Or? Ah. So um, I guess there are different definitions. So we don't expect them to coincide, coincide, sorry. Okay, I thought I heard myself from the microphone. We don't expect them to coincide. So it's not that they're like, I guess if you want to say less local, it depends how you're defining locality, right? So, so um, I mean, it's like comparing apples and oranges. A little bit, yeah. The functions we get are very local, I guess I can say that, right? So, so they, and in many cases they look the same and we do measure them then on the same objective and we're getting to similar things. I can't say we're getting the same local minima because the local minima can be slightly different. <coughs> yeah. now, following this apple and the ordinary thing, I, there's, it is something I don't understand. So I'm saying for the same function, you compare different definitions. Of, yes. Right? I would say, like, uh, with the same spread, you compare different, like, localization schemes. Yep. But this is, like, a different localization scheme and different definition yes. of spread. Like, so, so maybe I should have left this off in some sense, right? And so if I want to get local functions, all I care about is having a sensible objective and optimizing it, right? And the, the functions I get either this way or this way are good, right? It doesn't mean the numbers are the same because they're slightly different metrics but these are just proxy metrics, right? I'm using these computationally to say, I want local functions, how am I going to compute them, right? It's somewhat less about, or sometimes it's somewhat less about, here's the exact definition of locality that I need minimized, right? So if I, this was maybe just to show that, you know, the numbers don't match up between the two formula, but if I left this off, then it's, 
I'm going to define two objective functions, both of which are sensible maybe definitions of locality, and try to optimize them. And one of them is much nicer to optimize than the other. And I still get local functions out. Yep. Um, cool, yes? Um, the spread is the sum of the spreads of all different. Yeah, this is actually the sum of the spreads of. of maybe there is only one function which is not localized, that's what you have. Yes, so I'd have to go back. We have uh, some plots that are the locality of each individual function for this. I'd have to go back and look at it. Some do converge faster than others. And there's actually, right, recently there's work people look at, can I try to minimize the least local orbital or things and do things to estimate this? Yeah, so. Um, okay, so just to quickly say, um, we tried this with a bunch of random initializations just to see, like, how well can you converge from sort of bad points, right? Like, we wouldn't necessarily expect this to work well. And we looked at uh, optimizing our formulation and then the uh, sort of maximum localized Meniere function versus our Vanderbilt formulation. And what we see is that even starting from random initial gauges, we can actually converge often in less than 100 iterations to a good local minima. So every time I get a point on here, there's uh, 50 random initializations, and this is the fraction of them that have converged by some iteration, okay? So we see that, you know, this is on a logarithmic scale here by like 30, 40 iterations, they all start converging very quickly, right? And I mean, they don't all take the exact same number of iterations. Some take 30, some take 50, some take closer to 100, but they get there. Um, using the, the other formulations for spread, the tail is much longer, right? So some of them converge close to 100 iterations. Sometimes it takes like 1,000 iterations, right? So we're converging in sort of an order of magnitude fewer iterations. So the, I believe the truncated density convolution is much nicer to optimize than the, the Marjorie Vanderbilt formulation. Uh, it's even more dramatic for some other things. So this is for CR203, same experiment. Again, we're sort of consistently converging in 100 iterations. There's one that didn't converge, so that initialization was particularly bad. But, you know, 95% of the time we converged in 100 iterations, and with the other formulations it's taking over 1,000 to, to just converge, to just say, you know, we've, we've sort of stopped improving the spread Let's, let's uh, call it a day, okay? All right, so uh, I wanna say just a few things and then to maybe take the, the, the two minutes late I started to say, go through the last slides quickly. So just kind of what the outlook is for this. So experiments suggest that this is a much nicer uh, function to optimize, a much nicer objective function to use for computing local orbitals, certainly maybe in robustness in, in terms of uh, how nice and, and smooth it is, finding less sort of false local minima. So one way to look at that is if we look at any optimization trace for this, it converges just like we would expect a, say, method to on a smooth objective function, okay? Uh, there's some Julia codes forthcoming that, that Kang was working on, so uh, called WTPJL, and uh, this is from the second part of the talk that I'll say things on for two minutes. Um, and we've actually, and this is a good connection to the prior talk, we'd been talking with uh, Antoine Levette and things about getting some of this into uh, DFTK and, and sort of having localization methods there. Since these are also Julia codes, things uh, work out marvelously in that. So I, I didn't know Eric was gonna have an advertisement for that, but it worked out, worked out nicely that I can play off that. Um, and I think that the highlight here that I wanna make is that not all the formula we get are completely new, but it's interesting that uh, people have not actually looked at how much of an impact these differences have on the actual computation of local functions versus just, okay, I have subtly different definitions, but maybe I think of them as all the same. Whereas clearly from, like, I think, the previous three slides, there are substantial differences between these. It's not that it's all just, just the same picture. Okay, so uh, in, in two minutes, I do just want to quickly say, and I'll uh, have to skip some of these slides, because I think about 11.10, right? Or, or just Sorry? Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes, all right. So I do want to say, um, I talked a lot about optimization and showed pictures where we start with random initial guesses. But uh, in a lot of prior work, what I've been working on was how you get good initial guesses automatically, right? So not finding things by hand and saying, I want to put this kind of orbital on this atom and so on. But can you automatically find good initializations for localization methods? And you can still pair this with the first part of the talk, right? You can think of it as, I find a good point, and then I optimize a nice function, and that's the best of both worlds, right? Okay. So uh, the, the question I put on here is, do you always need to optimize? Uh, and I guess then, because I put a question mark, uh, Betteridge's Law of Headlines says the answer to this is no. Um, and 
the, the reason is that uh, some, some work we've done several years ago on something known as selective, selected columns of the density matrix, or SCDM, gives you a sort of direct method for localization or a good initialization for optimization. You can sort of think of it either way. Um, it's a method that works in, in the condensed phase with K points, can work with or, or without entangled bands. More recently, we have uh, for working in atomic orbital bases. And it's now part of more and more code. So it's in the Quantum Espresso 1 year 90 interface. Um, I was looking recently, apparently it's in, in VASP, but I don't actually know um, that much about it other than I found it in their, their documentation. So we were not, uh, or at least I was not involved with that. And when you're not in the entangled case, it's a completely parameter free way to do localization. Like there's no, you don't have to specify an initialization or, or anything, okay? So I'll maybe just give the, the two slide punchline and then, then wrap up. The nice thing is it's a three line algorithm. And it's a three line algorithm in the following sense, which is if you have that matrix way from earlier psi, I just have to do three things. I compute a somewhat standard matrix factorization of it, which is known as a column pivoted QR factorization. Okay, so this is uh, Golubin Bussinger from 1965, where you can find a textbook version in uh, Golubin Van Loan. Okay. I then use the permutation output by this matrix factorization to pick proto localized orbitals. Okay. And then I load and orthogonalize them. All right, because I want orthogonal orbitals. So to the question earlier, here we orthogonalize. And it turns out this does a remarkably good job of finding local orbitals. So when I solve this load orthogonalization problem, I get local orbitals, okay? And I'll, I'll say why this works and then stops. Uh, the reason this works is that one way to understand why you can compute local orbitals is that the density matrix for insulating systems has localized columns. And so this is something that's been sort of known and, and studied for a long time. And the idea is that matrix factorization we use, the column pivoted QR, identifies columns of the density matrix that form really good proto-localized orbitals, okay? And it does that because all the columns are well-localized and it finds a simultaneously well-conditioned subset. And that guarantees that when you orthogonalize them, you don't destroy the locality, right? If I picked two columns of the density matrix next to each other and orthogonalize them, they'll delocalize. But if I pick a well-conditioned set of columns, they won't delocalize when I orthogonalize them, okay? All right, and I'll just say this, this works. So this is one example where SCDM, you can see, and then we try to optimize it. You basically get to where you're going right from the start. If you start with D orbitals or, or SP2 orbitals, sometimes you converge to different local minima, or at the very least, it takes you some time to converge, okay? All right, I think with that, I am out of time, so I'll jump to my just uh, conclusion slide to have up there. So um, yeah, so we have sort of, uh, new definitions for periodic systems of centers and spreads, and then they're easier to optimize, and SCDM is a great way to do this uh, if you want a, a good initialization, okay? And, oops, where is it not? And then I'll, I'll go back to that. Uh, references you for all this you can find on my website. Um, here's the sort of key ones. We're still working on the manuscript for the first part, but here's some key ones for the other ones as this PDF will go online. But website's probably the best place, so, okay. Thank you. <laughs>